We're glad you decided to check out this message by Seabreeze Church and hope that you benefit from it. We also hope that you would join us either online or in person on a Sunday. We have a nine o'clock live stream service online. And then we have in-person services on our campus at 9 and 1030. So again, we hope that you would join us and we hope that you enjoy this message. Well, good morning. It's great to be with you guys today. A um, couple of months ago, I was hanging out with some other dads and our kids were running around playing. I think it was a bounce house event or something and the kids were all I'm um, in the bounce house jumping, and us dads, we were standing around talking, and one of the um, dads asked, as we were standing there, he said, hey, have any of you guys been to one of those trampoline parks? One of those, you know, you know it's like in a warehouse, there's all the different trampolines that you can jump on, and I had been, and um, when I was there at the trampoline park, I had a great time. I mean, there was like a basketball hoop that is set way too high, and you're supposed to see if you can dunk on it, and there's foam pits that you can do flips into, and all kinds of fun stuff. So when I was there, I mean, I went all out at this trampoline park. And I had a great time until the next morning. <laughs> I woke up the next morning, and my back was killing me. And actually, I thought, you know, the thought that went through my head was something, this is rare. This probably doesn't happen to other dads. I mean, I'm probably the only dad that goes to the trampoline park and then wakes up in pain. So when this dad asks this and says, hey, has anybody been to a trampoline park? I didn't say anything because I was a little embarrassed. But then another dad chimes in and he said, you know, I took my kids to the trampoline park and I was bouncing for a while. And then I got off the trampolines and was walking around. And I started to think, I think I just broke my back. <laughs> and then another dad said almost the exact same thing. He's like, yeah, I went, but I had to stop because I was in so much pain. And for me, this realization of a... Uh, of what trampoline parks are now like as an adult, this is a sad realization for me. Because when I was growing up, I loved the trampoline. We didn't have a trampoline in our backyard, but a lot of my friends did, a lot of our neighbors did. And we'd go over to their houses and we would just bounce and bounce for hours. I mean, you name it, we did flips, crack the egg was my favorite. I was the kid that was like, if I was the egg, I wasn't cracking. You had to launch me off the trampoline in order to get me to crack. And it was back in the days when they didn't have the net around the trampoline. They didn't have the pad over the springs. I mean, these were trampolines of consequence, the good old days. I loved, I loved those trampolines. But something happened when I got into my 30s, and my relationship with gravity has changed, and I can't bounce and do the things that I did when I was in my teens and my 20s. Because if I do, I know that gravity is real, and I know that if I try to ignore gravity now, I know I'm going to pay a price for it. This summer, what we're going to do is we're going to study through the book of First John. It's a book in the New Testament. It's a short five-chapter book. It's located towards the back of the Bible, just a few books before you get to the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible. And the title for this study through First John is From True to Real, Moving Faith from Head to Heart. And in this study of 1 John, we're going to be challenged to take the truths we say we agree with and make them reality in our lives. And this is important because as humans, we have the ability to hold many facts in our brains that we do absolutely nothing about. You could say that we have two different functional categories for truth. When we learn that something's true, we encounter a fact, we put it in one of two categories. One category we'll call the true category. These are things that we, we learn about, they're facts, and we say, yeah, that's true. The stuff that we put in the true category applies to ideas that I accept as true, but which do not affect my daily life. We look at them and we say, yeah, that's true. But functionally, they don't make any demands on our lives. They don't affect our daily lives. At least we don't think they do. Then there's another category and we'll title that category, Real. This applies to ideas that I know not only believe to be true, but I'm also convinced these things can dramatically impact my daily life for good or for bad. Both, both items that we put in either category, they're both true. But the things that we put in one category, we kind of nod our head at and say, yeah, that's true, but I really don't need to factor that into my decision-making process. It doesn't make any demands on my life. But things that we put into the other category, we not only nod our heads and say, yeah, that's true, but then we say, that's real. I, I've got to consider that. I've got to factor that in because if I ignore that, that's going to have real implications for my life. You know, take, take the circumference of the earth. 
the world is approximately 25,000 miles around at the equator. Now, if I'm an international airline pilot, I've got to factor that into my decision making as I fly. That fact makes demands on my life. But I'm not a pilot. When I fly, I'm only a passenger, and I rarely fly. So I can look at that fact and say, yeah, that's true, but that doesn't make any demands on my life. Gravity is another thing that's true. But for me, gravity isn't just a fact that's true, it's a reality. It's why I don't bounce on the trampoline the same way I did when I was younger. I know that if I ignore gravity, it's going to show up and encounter me in the way of real physical pain. So it's not just a, yeah, gravity's true. Then I just go and do what I want. It's, well, gravity's true. It's in the real category. I can't ignore this. This makes demands on my life. We have these two different functional categories that we put the ideas that we encounter into. There's a, a true category, but then there's a, this is real category. For the majority of American Christians, much of what the Bible says about God and how life works is in the true category, but not the real category. We hear stuff from the Bible. We hear about who God is, how God wants us to live, how the world works. We can nod our heads at it and say, that's true. But then often what happens is we can turn around and we can live a life that's counter to what we just said is true. We can turn around and live a life that's actually in opposition to the truth about God and how he wants us to live that we just said we agree with. You know, this shows up in a lot of different ways in our lives. For me, for instance, it's one of the ways that it shows up in, in my life is in the area of prayer. You can take prayer, for instance. I know, here are some facts that I know about prayer. I know that God's, God hears my prayers. I know that when I pray, I'm not just praying to a silent void, but I'm praying to a person who hears me. I know that he hears my prayers. I know that prayer impacts what happens. There are some things that will happen if you pray. There are other things that won't happen if you pray. Prayer has an impact on what happens. I know that prayer is a privilege of being in a relationship with God and getting to relate to him in that way. These are all truths that I know about prayer. But oftentimes what can happen to me if I'm not careful is I can get up and I can get started with my day and I can just kind of full steam ahead, move through my day, and largely live a prayerless existence. Because for me, it's really easy to take all that truth about prayer and put it in the, well, that's true category, but then live as though it doesn't make any demands on my life. I live, and it's in the true category, but it doesn't always show up in the real category where I go through my day and I see the importance of it. We have these two functional categories, and this also applies to the things of God. I mean, you could go on and on down the list of different ways this shows up. Take forgiveness, for instance. I mean, as Christians, one of the things that we know, we know that we've been forgiven by God. We know that God wants us to forgive others. We know that one of the primary marks of somebody who's received forgiveness from God for their sins, one of the primary indicators is their willingness to offer forgiveness when they're wronged, and to go and ask for forgiveness when they're the ones in the wrong. This is one of the primary marks. People that do this are called the children of God in the Bible. We know that that's true, but then a lot of times what happens in our lives is we abandon friendships or we avoid family members because of unresolved conflict. I mean, you could just go on and on down the list. You could talk about sex. You could talk about marriage. You could talk about how we spend our money, the words that we choose to use, how we go about our work. We might give the right answer on a test. You give us a test, we might fill in the right word, choose the right option. We might get the right answer on a written test. But when it comes to our lives, a lot of times, not always the case, but a lot of times, we take the things the Bible says about God and how God wants us to live, we put it in the true category. Yeah, that's true. We nod our head at it. But in the, in the category where it shows up in how we live our lives, the real category, the category that makes demands on the decisions that we make. Oftentimes, who God is and the way God says to live doesn't show up in that category. The factor that determines which category we decide to put something into, whether we put a fact in the true category or the real category, 
is if we think there are consequences attached to that item. If there's consequences, it goes in the real category. If we don't think that there's consequences, well, then we can just leave it in the true category. For me, for instance, with gravity, actually, we went ahead and we bought our kids a trampoline earlier this year. And that's been a love-hate relationship for me so far this year because I want to go out there and bounce, but I know that I can't. Actually, yesterday, one of the kids was like, Dad, come bounce on the trampoline. And the thought that went through my head was, I've got to get up on stage and speak tomorrow. I'm going to be standing. I don't want to go bounce and then be in pain tomorrow. To me, because there's consequences, gravity is in the real category. But a lot of times, with who God is and the things of God, the consequences don't show up immediately. They show up over time. Sometimes it takes years, decades, half a lifetime to experience the consequences for ignoring the things of God. So a lot of times what we do, because the consequences aren't immediate, but they're delayed, they're not experienced in the short term, they're experienced in the long term. Because of that, a lot of times we, we nod our head and we say, that's true. And we put it in the true category, and then we ignore it, thinking that, well, there's not really any consequences that I need to pay attention to. One of the things that John's going to do as we go through the book of 1 John is he's going to diagnose where we're at. As we go through this study again and again, he's going to bring up a topic, and he's going to shine a light on where are we at in relation to this topic. Have we put it in the true category, or is this real for us? So he's going to help us diagnose, and he's also going to point out the consequences. You know, one of the things that we often think is, we often think that the only consequence we need to be concerned about is hell. And we think that, well, if we've decided to follow Jesus and we're saved, then hell is taken care of, so there really aren't any consequences that we need to be concerned with. But what's interesting about the book of 1 John is, as John writes this, he's not focused on eternity. He's focused on what happens right here and right now. What are the implications for our lives if we don't take this stuff about God and put it into the real category? That's what his focus is. So not only is he going to diagnose where we're at, he's going to help us figure out what are the consequences. The third thing that he's going to do, he's going to help us learn how do you move something from true to real. Because we all know it's not just willpower. You can't just say, okay, now it's real. There's some kind of process that you got to go through to move these ideas from truths that don't make a demand on you to realities on the level of gravity that determine your behavior. So that's what we're going to get to see as we go through this book. I want to start today, and we're going to start at the beginning of the book, And we're going to look at an invitation that John gives to make the truth about Jesus into a reality. He starts the book, and what he does is he invites us to know the reality of who Jesus is and Jesus' life-changing power just like he does. So he starts with this invitation. I'm going to start reading 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. This is what John writes. He writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testified to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. I want you to notice the repetition that he uses in this passage. Three times he says, we proclaim. We proclaim, we proclaim, we proclaim. He's starting with an announcement. And he tells us what the announcement's about. The first time he says, we proclaim, it refers to the word of life. The second time, it's attached to eternal life. The third time when he says, we proclaim, it's attached to something that he said earlier when he says, the life appeared. So John is starting by announcing something that is really important. All three of these references to life have to do with Jesus, and we're going to get more into that in just a minute. But it's interesting to me that John is writing to a group of people at the time who were alive, just like us. Their their hearts are beating, their lungs are expanding, their brains are firing. They're physically alive. But John's writing them, and he's saying, I have something to proclaim to you about life. In other words, what he's saying is he's saying, hey, you, you group of people that are alive, What you think life is, is no life at all. I've got news for you about what real, true life is. And this is a pretty big claim. 
This is an announcement that should at least get us to sit up and pay attention as we go through this. And John stakes this assertion about life, that he's got news about what real life is, what it means to really be alive, to really live. He stakes this assertion on two claims that he makes about who Jesus is. Two claims that reveal who Jesus is and how it's possible for him to give us this life. The first claim that John makes is that Jesus is God. And throughout the passage, John doesn't just say this one time, he weaves this throughout the passage. It's really interesting how he does this. He starts, the very, thing for, the very first thing he writes, he refers to Jesus and he says, that which was from the beginning. This is a reference to Jesus. We'll see more about this in just a second. But it's the idea, by starting with this, it's the idea that Jesus has eternally existed. Before the succession of life began, Jesus was. He goes on, he calls Jesus the word of life. This is another really interesting one. The word here, word in English, is a Greek word. It's the word logos. And there are several reasons that John uses this word to describe Jesus. Instead of just outright saying Jesus is life, he says word, word of life. And he does this for several reasons, but a significant one is that at the time of his writing, Greeks referred to the word or logos as the governing force behind everything that happened. And so what John is doing for his Greek audience in doing this is he's clarifying that the thing behind everything that happens, it's not a force. It's not an inanimate object that just causes things. It's a person. The person has a name. His name is Jesus. Jesus is God. That's the claim that he's making. He does this in some of his other writings. John actually wrote four other books that are included in the Bible, five Five books in total that are included in the Bible. One of the other books he wrote is referred to as the Gospel of John, one of the four biographies about Jesus' life. And John starts that book, and notice how he starts the book. John 1.1, he writes, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Again, later on, you read the first chapter of John. Later on in the passage, he makes it really clear when he uses the word, word, logos, he's talking about Jesus. Notice how it, the similarities, in the beginning, in the beginning was the word, that which was from the beginning, similarities in these passages, and then the outright claim, the word was God. He's saying Jesus is God. He's not fully unpacking it for us, he's not giving all the evidence, he's just starting with a very big, bold claim, and he's making it in a lot of different ways. Another place in the first John passage that we're reading where he claims that Jesus is God is when he says that which was with the Father. What this is, is this is a nod to the Trinity. It's a unique God idea that's only found in the Bible. It's not found in other religions. The idea of the Trinity is that there's only one God. There's not multiple gods. There's only one God, but that God exists in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not God showing up in three different ways, but three unique persons that make one God. The idea of the Trinity is one of those ideas that, as you think about it, it'll get your head to start swimming. It's a complex idea, but it's an idea that the Bible validates this idea again and again and again. If you dive into the Bible to see, is this really in the Bible? You find this over and over and over again. One God who exists in three persons. So when he says that he was with the Father in the beginning, John is saying that Jesus is God. And his goal here, again, he's not trying to unpack all the complexities of the Trinity in these opening verses. His goal is simply to make the claim loud and clear, Jesus is God. So that's his first claim, Jesus is fully God. The second claim is Jesus is human. John claims that Jesus is fully human. At the same time, and this is He interweaves this with the claim that Jesus is God, making the point that these two are inseparable when it comes to who Jesus is. Notice how he does this. Three times he says, we have seen, referring to our physical eyes have seen his physical body. Two times he says, we've heard. We've heard him talk. We saw with with his, his vocal cords, the words, the sound came out of his mouth. We've heard him talk. One time he says, we've looked at and our hands have touched. We, we can verify that he had a physical body. This could be a reference to an event that took place after what's referred to as the resurrection. Jesus went to the cross, he rose on the third day, and then he appeared to his disciples. And when he appeared to them, 
Some of them questioned if he was real. Some of them thought, well, maybe it's just a ghost. Maybe you guys are seeing things. Is he really back to life? Is he really here in his physical body? Did he really rise from the grave? And he, he shows up to him, and he sticks out his hands, and he says, he says, put your hands in the holes in my hands from the nails. Here, in my side, they stabbed me with the spear. You saw the spear go into my side. Here, see the wound, see the scar in my side. Jesus is making the point to them that his physical body was just like theirs. So when John makes this claim, he says, we have looked at and our hands have touched. He's saying that Jesus had a real physical body just like yours and mine. Two times he says he appeared. The point is that at a specific time and place in history, God took on a human body and showed up in a way that could be witnessed to and verified. He's claiming, at the same time he's claiming Jesus is God, he's intertwining it with this idea that Jesus is fully human. Now, when you put these two claims together, this creates a lot of questions about who Jesus is, a lot of good questions that need to be answered. But probably the most pressing question is, why is it significant for Jesus to be fully God and fully man? What's the big reason? Why would this matter to our lives? Well, John answers that question, too. He answers that in the, in the gospel that he wrote. John chapter 3, verse 16, he writes, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And what the Bible teaches is that our sin has broken our re relationship with God. We are spiritually separated from him. We're actually dead in our sin. And because of this separation that we have now, if this separation is made permanent into eternity, that's why the word perishing is used. It's an eternal, it can become an eternal separation. Right now it's a spiritual separation, but if we enter eternity with that, then it's permanent. The wages of sin is death, is what another verse says. This is why the word perishing is used. But, like the verse points out, God so loved the world, Jesus came, he took on a body, he came to earth. He lived life exactly how it was supposed to be lived. In other words, Jesus lived the perfect life. If you want to know what it means to really live, Jesus shows us what it means to really live. Then he gave his divine, perfect life on the cross so that you and I could be brought back to life on the inside, so that we could receive eternal life and have our relationship with God restored. John starts, and when he writes this letter to his audience, he starts and he says, hey, I've got amazing news about what real life is. And then he stakes this assertion about what real life is on the claim that Jesus is fully God and Jesus is fully man. And because he's both, that means that Jesus can solve the problem of sin and give us real life. He starts and he stakes everything else that he writes on that claim that that's who Jesus is and that's what Jesus can give us. Now, I want you to notice something that's, that's often overlooked as we read this in English. I want you to notice John's attitude as he writes this. Because for John, this is as real to him as he writes this, or even maybe more real than when he experienced it years before. Scholars believe that John was probably 90 years old when he wrote this letter. So he's really excited about this. He's 90 years old. He's not a teenager that just gets excited about every little thing. And if John is 90 years old or kind of in that age range, that means it's probably been about 60 years between when Jesus left earth and when John writes this. And we all know what time does to excitement. Excitement fades over time, but not for John. As John writes this, like I said, he's probably more excited now than he's ever been about this topic. In this letter that he writes, it's written, written in the Greek language. Unfortunately, English does not do justice to how he's communicating this idea. Throughout the passage, he repeats, we have heard and we have seen. He says that several times in the passage. And when he says this, he keeps repeating it, adding emphasis to it. The verb is in the perfect tense. And in the perfect tense, that describes an action that took place in the past, but its effects are still being experienced in the present. He doesn't use the past tense. He uses the perfect tense. This is really significant. So instead of just saying, we have heard, like it translates, it would actually be more accurate to say, we have heard him speak and his words keep ringing in our ears. 
It's as real now as it was then. We can't unhear this stuff. And then when he says, we have seen, it would actually be more accurate to say, we saw him perform miracles. We saw him when he fed the crowds, when he hung on the cross. We saw him when he rose from the grave with the nail holes in his hands, the hole from the spear that pierced his side. We saw all this, and we can't unsee it. It's burned on our eyeballs. God came to earth in the man Jesus Christ to save us and give us life. And he just keeps repeating this. It happened, and it, we, we can't unsee it. We can't unhear it. John, as you read this, John, this 90-year-old man, is bursting with excitement about how amazing this reality is to him. And if we, if we think about what happens to us when we get excited about something, you know, if you've ever experienced something and you get really excited about it, what do you do with that excitement? Well, you go and you tell other people. You tell them because you want to invite them to experience the same thing so that they can share in your excitement. So John is really excited about this thing that isn't just true to him. This is real. This really happened. We experienced it. We can't forget this. It's as real to us today as it was then. And then he turns to his crowd and he says, I want you guys to experience that too. He writes this, verse 3. He says, we proclaim to you what we have seen and heard. We saw it. We can't unsee it. It's burned on our eyeballs. We heard it. We can't unhear it. His words are still ringing in our ears. So that, this is the reason that we're telling you this so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship was with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our collective joy. We write this to make all of our joy complete. The word fellowship means to be a partaker of something, to share in something. So what John is saying is he's saying, we're telling you the most amazing, exciting thing that has ever happened so that you can experience it too. We're not just telling you this so that you can know that it happened. We're telling you this because we're inviting it to be real in your life, just like it's real in our lives. So John's starting and he's saying, hey, Jesus came and he offers us real life. The life is only available because he's fully God and fully man. This is the most amazing thing that's ever happened. And we're writing this because we want this to be true for you too. He's inviting us to experience the reality of who Jesus is. A couple weeks ago, our family went on a vacation. We were up in uh, the mountains, and one of, uh, one of my favorite parts of the trip was seeing my five-year-old son, Cohen, play. He just, I mean, he had a great time when we were on vacation in the mountains. One of the, somebody brought um, masks and capes for the kids to dress up like superheroes, and all his cousins were there, and they had the woods that they could go run in. There were hiking trails, just all kinds of fun activities, and for this little group of cousins, I mean, it was it was nonstop activity for these kids. They were just go, 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 go the whole time. It was one of those trips where it was like everything was an adventure, everything was a battle to fight, and they were just, they had the best time. There were times actually, it, you know, it's one of those times when a kid is really having fun and they fall and they like scrape their knee and there's blood. When they get up and they act like nothing happened because they don't want the pain to get in the way of the fun that they're having, you know they're having fun. That was like the whole trip for these kids. One morning, we were having breakfast, and I was sitting next to Cohen, and um, he looked at me, and he just said, Dad, I'm sore. And I was like, yes. Like, I loved it, because I remember being a little kid. I remember, you know, just waking up in the morning, and it was just go, 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 go. And you're running through the woods, playing with your friends, and you're allowing your imagination to go wild, and you're sore, and you're bruised, and you're beat up, and you got scrapes on you, and you go to bed, and you just wake up, and you're just ready to do it all over again. And so I loved hearing him say that because I was like, yes, like, this is awesome. I mean, he's, he's doing what a five-year-old is supposed to be doing. And as I was thinking about how much fun he had on that trip, I couldn't help but reflect on something that we hear in our family quite often when we're at home. And this is what we hear quite often when we're at home. Dad, I'm bored. Can we watch something? And that's something that we hear quite often. I'd never heard that when we were on vacation. And the reason I think that we never heard it when we were on vacation was because it never went through their minds. Because of all that was available to them, all these amazing things, the playing, the imagination, the going outside and experiencing it, because of all that was available to them, the thought of sitting on a TV, atrophying in this vegetative state while this mediated reality washes over you, they were like, who wants to do that? We've got all this other stuff we could do. All these other amazing things. So they, they didn't even think, well, let's settle for something less. 
they wanted to go out and they wanted to experience it as real. And when I think about that, I think it's similar for us. Because I think for many of us, we've decided to follow Jesus. We hear the truth about who God is. We hear about the life that he offers. And we look at it and we say, yeah, that's true. But then, honestly, instead of experiencing the reality of it and the implications of that for our life, because we put it in the true category, we really settle for a bland existence. And we move from cheap thrill to cheap thrill. Because who Jesus is and the life that he offers is just left in the true category, and it doesn't make its way into the real category. C.S. Lewis wrote about this. He wrote about our tendency to settle for less than what God has called us to. And he said this. He said, we're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We put Jesus in the true category, and we miss out on how amazing life could be if he was real to us, just like he was real to John. My guess is this morning, we could probably divide ourselves into three groups. For some of us, some of you, you're exploring faith. You hear these truths about Jesus. You hear the claims that the Bible makes that he's fully God, fully man, that he can forgive our sins, he can save us, give us, restore our relationship with God. You hear this, and you're you're trying to decide, okay, well, is that true? Should I actually put it in the true category? What What should I do with this? For you, as you go through this study of 1 John, I think this is really going to be helpful because John's going to paint a picture of what life could be like if you decided to follow Jesus. So if that's you and you're trying to decide, I don't even know where I stand in relation to Jesus, I think this is the series for you. There are some of you that are here today, you've been Christians for a while. When you hear the claims about who Jesus is and the life that he offers, you nod your head, but honestly, you're passive in your obedience. Let me just warn you, John is going to make you very uncomfortable because what John's going to do is he's going to shine a light on the areas of your life where you've put God and his ways into the true category and it functionally doesn't impact you. John is going to shine a massive spotlight on that and it's going to be uncomfortable. But let me encourage you, don't ignore that. Don't just say like, yeah, I'm not going to do anything about that. Take the risk to change and experience what God has for you. Don't just settle for this bland life moving from one experience to the next. Take the risk to make Jesus real and experience life the way that he intends you to experience it. Then there's a third group in the room today. And for you, you do experience that Jesus is real. You, when you make decisions and you move through life, you take him seriously. You factor him in. When he says to do something, you do it. When he says not to do something, even though the consequences might not be readily available to you, you say, Jesus said not to do it, and that's enough for me. And so you're experiencing this. For those of you that are in the room that are experiencing it, this is going to be a really fun series. Because what John's going to do is he's going to say, come on, let's experience more of the reality of who Jesus is. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you came to earth. You entered into our situation. You gave your life so that we could be made alive. I think of your claim where you say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. God, I pray that as we go through this study in 1 John, I pray that we would experience the reality of that. I pray that we would do what is necessary to take what you say to take it out of just being a true item that we've heard to this is a reality. These are claims that we'll stake our life on. This will impact our decisions and our behavior because Jesus said to do this. So God, I pray that you would allow us and help us to experience you as real and how amazing life is when we do that. We thank you in Jesus' name.